I'm over here. I don't know, just get over here. Well, get used to it because we're here for the next couple of episodes. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rubin Awards are right around the corner, so we have a whole lot of comics to cover. I hereby officially announce the start of Rubin Month. Hello and welcome to the Punchline. I'm your comic strip critic. The Rubin Awards are coming. Just like last year, there are three categories to cover for this year's Rubin season, and I'm going to be giving my analysis and vote on who I feel should walk away with the award. There's a lot to cover across all three major categories, because this is a seriously good crop of nominees this year, including a number of comics that I've talked about before, in every category. It's good to see so many familiar faces on the show, so let's not wait any longer. Our first category to look at for this year's Rubens are the newspaper comic panels. Our three nominees are Dave Coverley's Speed Bump, Scott Hilburn's The Argyle Sweater, and Mark Parisi's Off the Mark. So how do these three stack up against each other? This one's pretty difficult to decide on. In my experience, panel comics tend to come in one of two main flavors. There are those with a regular cast, comics like Marmaduke, Family Circus, and Dennis the Menace, and then there are those like all of this year's nominees. Gagaday comics that alter cast, setting, tone, and premise for the best joke that the cartoonist can come up with. There are usually a lot of puns involved in these. The high water mark for these kinds of comics is usually regarded to be the far side, and there's definitely a touch of Gary Larson's work on all of this year's Rubin nominees. The thing is... I just can't really muster up a strong opinion on any of these comics, and I feel terrible for saying that. I just don't think that panel comics are my thing. I work best when I have a usual cast of characters to get to know and familiarize myself with, and the very nature of these kinds of comics means that it's very hard for me to get a baseline reading on what I'm getting. I'm not saying they're bad, they're all good, they're fine, all three of them! The artwork is energetic and lively, the creativity on display is great, and all of them have some funny and clever moments quite often. But they're all so similar that I really have trouble telling them apart. I feel like I'm being asked to pick my favorite from between three triplets. Why can't I just have them all? Shut up. Okay, enough stalling, enough beating around the bush. Let's just dig right into all three of these comics and see what makes them different from their competition. Let's start off with Speed Bump. Longtime viewers may recall that I've talked about this one before. Speed Bump was a nominee at last year's Rubin Awards and was, in fact, the comic that I gave my vote to. And Dave Coverley has continued to output good work in his signature sketchy style, which is almost grungy when compared to the other nominees. And trust me, there's nothing wrong with some grunge. All that extra sketching and shading adds a nice layer of detail. Speed Bump's a good strip worth checking out. The Argyle sweater still has some of that sketching and shading, but not to the same extent as Speed Bump. The artwork is a little more defined and cleaner, and this feels the closest in tone and humor to the far side of the three nominees. Seriously, I was almost fooled for a moment into thinking that a few of these were in fact the far side, and that Go Comics' website had glitched up on me. I think it's safe to say that Scott Hilburn was a huge Gary Larson fan growing up, and yep, in fact, he it was. As far as role models go, that's a good one to have. The Argyle sweater's a good strip, worth checking out. Longtime viewers may recall that I've talked about this one before. Wait, I just finished saying that... You've been messing with my scripts again, haven't you? Off the Mark won the Rubin Award back in 2012, and I had the chance to talk about the comic back then. It has the cleanest artwork of the three, and is still pretty funny. It usually has the brightest colors of this year's nominees, and it's got some other sort of quality to it that I'm having trouble defining. It looks like the sort of humorous birthday card that you might get your brother or a close friend. It's the most simply drawn of the three. Yes, it's a good strip, and it's worth checking out. Alright, so much for going in depth with all three of those, because that got us exactly nowhere. So, how do we determine who walks away with the Rubin Award? We're going to have to go by the simplest quality that these can have. Which one made me laugh the most? And going by that criteria, 
I'm going to be choosing the Argyle sweater. I just found this to be the funniest comic presented. There's a good combination of puns, wordplay, and visual humor in the mix, so you'll be guaranteed to find one that appeals to your style of humor. And that's a win for everyone. So, my vote for Outstanding Newspaper Comic Panel of the Year goes to Scott Hilburn and his work on the Argyle sweater. Now then, the next category is Best Newspaper Comic Strip. And there are three nominees in this category as well, two of which we've covered before. Our nominees are Isabella Bannerman's Six Chicks, Mark Dutulli's Leo, and Terry Liebitson's The Pajama Diaries. Before I begin discussing these comics, let me just make one thing clear. <clears throat> I am not biased. Yes, Mark Dutulli and Terry Liebitson have both appeared on the show before but I don't judge these comics based on how much I know the cartoonist who makes them. I judge these comics based on who bribes me with the most money. Since The Pajama Diaries was literally my last episode, we won't spend a ton of time on it here. The antics of Jill Kaplan and her family are a great read, exploring motherhood, womanhood, and Judaism, along with other themes with some very engaging storylines, clever humor, and great artwork. If this doesn't make it into my top 5 comics of 2014, I will be a very, very surprised man. Longtime viewers may recall that I've talked about this one before- Wait a minute. Alright, that is it. I am handwriting all of my scripts from now on, just so you can't mess with them. Mark Tertulli's Macabre Comedy is another favorite of mine. This comic oozes style and atmosphere, and I'm convinced that the titular character ran away from his real family. And which family would that be? Well, everybody with me now. Leo continues to embrace old horror monsters and tropes, and brazenly takes swipes at some of the other comics that surround him, even being so bold as to call out Charlie Freakin' Brown for being a zombie strip. And he does it all without a single speech bubble. It's wonderful. Our last nominee is one that's only been mentioned very, very briefly in a few past Punchline episodes, but it's one of the most unique premises to a comic strip that I've ever seen, and that includes Zippy the Pinhead. Six Chicks is drawn by Isabella Bannerman. Partially. Six Chicks' premise is one of the most unique things I've ever seen in comics. Each day of the week, a different cartoonist, one of the titular six chicks, draws the comic. This idea was the brainchild of former King Features Syndicate editor-in-chief Jay Kennedy, who wanted more women cartoonists to have a chance to break into the business. The six chicks are Margaret Shulock, Rena Piccolo, Ann Gibbons, Benita Epstein, Stephanie Pirro, and the cartoonist nominated for the Rubin Award, Isabella Bannerman. Since Isabella Bannerman was specifically called out by name in the Rubin nominees, we'll be focusing on her contribution to Six Chicks, which appears on the Monday edition. Most of the comics that appear in Six Chicks are panel comics, which, to be honest, kind of confuses me. I guess that now I'm not sure where the dividing line between a comic strip and a comic panel is. Bannerman's artwork reminds me a fair bit of Hillary Price's Rhymes with Orange, Long-time viewers may recall me talking about this comic before- Oh, come on! You're fired for the rest of the episode! I said get out! Go! Go! Jeez. Reminds me a fair bit of Rhymes with Orange, one of last year's Rubin nominees, because of the same simple coloring and sketchy line work. The sense of humor reminds me a lot of our best panel nominees, with a lot of wordplay, puns, and other visual gags. There's no consistent cast of characters, which makes sense considering the rotating cartoonist format of the strip. Either we'd be dealing with six different casts for each cartoonist, or one cast drawn six different ways. I can only imagine the logistical nightmare that would be. It's pretty clever, and I'm glad to see the Six Chicks experiment working out in promoting new talent to the scene. Without a doubt, it's the most unique way of approaching a comic that I've ever seen, and that includes Zippy the Pinhead's Surreal Madness. So those are the best strip nominees. How do they compare to each other? Who should walk away with the Rubin Award? Well, I hate to cut her out of the running so soon, but Isabella Bannerman's work on Six Chicks just can't compete. 
Her artwork lacks the style and atmosphere of Leo and the cleanliness and detail of the Pajama Diaries. And not having a regular cast is something that I just personally can't get over. I understand why it is that way, I won't begrudge her for it, but I really can't connect to a comic that doesn't have a central theme or a core cast of characters. So that leaves Leo and the Pajama Diaries, and oh boy, oh boy, this is a tough choice. Walk to Tuli offers up a wonderfully immersive and unique atmosphere. Terry Liebenson, on the other hand, brings interesting themes and very clever writing to the plate. Who wins this one? This is such a tough choice here. Leo's horror movie throwback aesthetic and black and white silent movie feel is wonderfully immersive. It's an imaginative strip that revels in how irreverent and macabre it is compared to almost every other comic out there. It pays tribute to old comics on one day and then mocks classics the next. I love it. It's like if Calvin and Hobbes were raised on old universal horror movies. A delightfully twisted mix of comedy and horror, Leo could be seen playing patty cake with the Slender Man and not have it seem out of place. The kid literally does not know the meaning of the word fear. The Pajama Diaries plays things much closer to home. No, not like that. It's a much more realistically grounded comic with a focus on relatable scenarios and character relationships. I also really admire the fact that the comic explores themes of motherhood, womanhood, and especially Judaism. It makes for a really engaging look into a culture and lifestyle that I've never been a part of. And while the standard day-to-day -day artwork is fantastic on its own, the fact that format is played with so often means that we get to see some really interesting ideas pop up from time to time. Honestly, either one of these could win the Reuben. They're both excellent strips. It could be a tie in the end, which wouldn't surprise me, but I'm not going to name a tie here. It always feels like a cop-out to me when an award is handed out in a tie. Number two. Ariel and Jasmine from The Little Mermaid and Aladdin. So with that in mind, I'm going to cast a definitive declarative vote. And that vote is going to go to the Pajama Diaries. The deciding factor lies in the wider variety of topics that are brought to the table. Mark Tatuli brings a wonderful, worthwhile, tasty Baconator, but Terry Liebenson brings a full-blown, multi-course gourmet pork dinner. Actually, I should probably use a different analogy when I'm talking about the Jewish-themed comic strip. Terry Liebenstein brings a five-course gourmet meal starting with salmon. Leo has the horror tributes and commentary on other comics that I greatly enjoy, but the Pajama Diaries offers so many more things that it just makes for a more socially relevant comic strip. So those are the comics that I will be casting my vote towards. Scott Hilburn's The Argyle Sweater and Terry Liebenstein's The Pajama Diaries. Let me know what you thought of my decisions down in the comments. Do you think I'm right or do you think I'm a blithering idiot? Either way, I would love to hear. We have one more category to take a look at, the cartoonist of the year, and we'll get to that next episode. Until next time, though, I'm your comic shipper, and I read the funny pages in search of comics like these.